Okay. Well, uh, thank you for the invitation to give this lecture. I don't know how you name names, but um, anyway, to celebrate the life and work of our dear friend and colleague, Anthony Hyman. Would that he were here with us tonight. Well, certainly his spirit is with us. And it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Thank you for your support. In inviting me to give this lecture, Professor Jonathan Goodhand wrote, we think it would be very appropriate, given your recent book and your long-term engagement with Afghanistan, as well as the fact that it would be nice to have a, a talk that reminds people of other facets of Afghanistan beyond the military or political situation that have got less coverage in recent years. I responded, of course, music and politics are closely connected but I shall avoid yet another account of the recent history of the censorship of music and concentrate on some very significant positive developments in the last 15 years. Of course, things are not, are not looking too good at the moment with recent attacks in Kabul, Jalalabad, Farah and elsewhere, but I will not be put off and will try to say and show something uplifting to dispel the gloom. And um, as obvious, much of what I have to say is contained in this book, um, but this is not a launch. There aren't copies of the book for sale or anything like that. But the monograph begins with a brief account of two years of ethnomusicological fieldwork in Herat in the 1970s, and goes on to describe a series of visits to work with Afghan musicians in exile and in Afghanistan itself up to 2014 and engagement over 40 years. Do come in. As our dear friend Lee Stusset is wont to remark, I always say, no one goes to Afghanistan once. Once you go, you always go back. Clearly, many of you here tonight, myself included, share Lisa's fascination with and commitment to Afghanistan and its people, and have gone back over and over again. Among other things, the monograph demonstrates this close relationship between music and politics, between the place of music making in Afghan life and the ideology of those in power culminating in the religious persecution of musicians during the Taliban era. If there was a slow build-up to the state of affairs, recovery has not been rapid and is far from complete, especially in areas where Taliban influence prevails. It is with aspects of this recovery that we're concerned tonight. Do come and find yourselves a nice seat over here, perhaps. We'd like to see a full house. In part, this recovery, which is considerable, is due to the phenomenal rise in independent radio and television stations after 2001, as described by David Page and Shirazuddin Siddiqui's report, The Media in Afghanistan, The Challenge of Transition, published in uh, 2012. Until 2002, radio and television broadcasting was tightly controlled by the Ministry of Information and Culture. Western countries saw free media as a pillar of the new democracy they sought to bring to Afghanistan. The government granted broadcasting licenses more or less on demand. According to Page and Sidiqi, in their report, by two 2010, there were 75, do come in, 75 terrestrial TV stations, 30 of them in Kabul, 8 in Herat. There were 175 FM stations in the country, 34 of them operated by the Ministry of Information and Culture. There was also an extraordinary growth in the use of mobile telephones. A country that had been dogged by
by poor communications for so long, suddenly had the resources to enter the modern world. A range of financial backers and audiences supported these radio and TV broadcasters. External donors funded some local radio and TV stations, advertising financed others. There were the so-called warlord channels, connected with former militia and mujahideen leaders such as Dustam, Hekmatyar and Rabani, and some channels had specific religious or political affiliations. There was, and remains, the problem of a lack of regulatory framework. Only occasionally was a channel closed down because of its promotion of sectarian propaganda, and then only for a short while. Music was regularly broadcast by some of these stations, perhaps notably by Tolo TV, which concentrated on Afghan popular music of a kind appreciated by young Afghans. This is the new Fast Music, or Musique Mast, which was developed by young musicians in the Afghan diaspora, especially in the USA and in Germany, inspired in part by Western pop music. Tolo has, for some years, held an annual pop idol type of music competition, Setare Afghanistan, Afghan Star, which achieved a degree of notoriety through including young women vocalist competitors. Some radio stations concentrate more on recordings of older popular singers, such as Ahmad Zahir, sometimes dubbed the Elvis Presley of Afghanistan. And there is a station, I think, in Kabul that only plays the recordings of Zahir Shah, and it's very popular with taxi drivers, so you get Zahir Shah whenever you get into a taxi there. Maybe that's right, maybe it's wrong. Another factor in the revitalization of music was the return of musicians who were in exile, some to resume their working lives in Afghanistan, others to make family visits. Several of Afghanistan's superstars of popular music in the diaspora visited Afghanistan to give large-scale concerts. Farhad Daryar's concert in Kabul on the 14th of May 2004 was held in the football stadium to a crowd estimated at 45,000. Farhad Daryar later described the event to Simon Broughton for Songlines, the world music magazine. He said, it was like a national day in Kabul. In the stadium, I felt like a cloud flying over the sky of the crowd. What was amazing was the presence of women. Men and women were sitting next to each other for a concert right where they had seen their beloved ones executed. Many of them were dancing and crying. It looked like they had forgotten the misery and pain of the past decades. Even the 700 armed security guys started to dance to the music and enjoy the new wave of hope. I wanted a fresh start in Afghanistan with music, and we did it. Well, that should give you the general idea of what's been going on. Now I'm going to concentrate on two educational institutions in Kabul, the music school run by the Aga Khan Music Initiative, ACME, and the Afghanistan National Institute of Music, ANIM. They represent the most significant developments in the field of music education in recent years. And it should be remembered that music was never part of the school curriculum in Afghanistan in the past. After the defeat of the Taliban government in 2001, we at Goldsmiths University of London established the Afghanistan Music Unit with the intention of researching the state of music in Afghanistan and determining what should be done to encourage the regeneration of Afghan music culture. To this end, I visited Kabul in 2002, supported financially by the British Academy's Committee for Central and Inner Asia. Razir, I think you remember them. I was equipped with my indispensable research tool, the mini DV camcorder. In the old city of Kabul, near to the former royal palace, there was an area known as the Kuche Kharabot. It is, in effect, a musician's quarter where in the past many families of hereditary musicians lived. 
Some of their ancestors came from India in the 1860s during the reign of Amir Sher Ali Khan and were employed as entertainers at his court as singers, musicians, and dancers. They were conversant with various genres of Hindustani music and dance, and their instruments were mainly tabla, sarangi, and the rabab. While they performed Indian music and dance as practiced at that time in India, in the context of the Kabul court, priority was laid on the art of ghazal singing in a distinctive Afghan style that laid emphasis on mystical Sufi poetry combined with dramatic changes of tempo and the use of rhythmic cadences that arguably derive from Pashtun regional music. The term Kuche Kharabot means Kharabot Ali, and the word Kharabot has a very interesting semantic field. It derives from the word Kharab, broken, destroyed, and can mean a tavern, a gaming house, or a brothel, somewhere to go to get broken down. <laughs> But in Sufi terminology, kharabot is an important and frequently used word that implies the destruction of the Sufi's self-will and his or her complete subjugation, subordination, and obedience to God. Thus, the term is infused with ambiguity, mixing the sacred and the profane. By the mid-20th century, many dozens of professional musicians lived in the kharabot, Local Afghan hereditary musicians had joined those whose ancestors came from outside Afghanistan. The musician community included all the great Ustads, master musicians of Kabul, such as Ustad Qasem, Ustad Ghulam Hussein, Ustad Nebi Gul, and Ustad Sheda. The denizens of the Kharabot constituted an important musical resource in Afghanistan. Many of them worked full-time at Radio Kabul when it became operational in the 1940s. Some ran private music schools in their homes. They taught youngsters from within the Kharabat who learned through an apprenticeship system in which they paid through service to their teacher. They also taught amateur musicians from outside, people like me, who paid for their lessons in cash and gifts. As a collective, the musicians constituted an occupational guild with their own protocols and with Mohinuddin Chishti as their patron saint. His mazar is in Ajmer, outside in India. During the coalition period, much of the Kharabot was destroyed in the internecine fighting between rival Mujahideen groups battling for control of Kabul. Many of the musicians and their families from the Kharabat sought refuge in Pakistan, especially in Peshawar, where they set up business premises in Khalil House on University Road, which became a sort of conservatory in exile. With the new dispensation following 2001, many of these Kharabat musicians returned to Kabul. And during my visit in 2002, I was conducted by Ustad Golam Hussein, the Rabob player, on a tour of the ruins. Now, are we going to put the lights down here? So we, we're, from now on, we have a series of video clips, and um, we thought it would be better to have these in a slightly darkened room, so Charles is adjusting the lighting. Okay, video clip one. Accept of the sound. Olé, olfatado, 
مصطفی قاسم مصطفی قلاب سین اینا زد این تنگلای موسیقی میشد کم تنگلای موسیقی بود تو یو نرمندا میشد تو فکر نمیکرد که تو هستی یا میگفت کدوم تنگل موسیقی است کل اون صفیدا بزرگا مصطفی قاسم دیگه در این منطقه در این میدان است یعنی میگه مفلای اوسیان بر پا میکردن اول از همه دیدی که چی شده هیچ کس نمود است یعنی از این بیشتر شد طرف بریم خانیوز رو بریم بخشا خانیوز را شاید هست یا خانی پدری رو ساده این بخش هست یعنی جد خانی پدری شان هست چی نام بریم بخش چیز مامودی شاچه مامودی شاچه مامودی پدر ساده این بخش شاچه مامودی نمودشت بریم ساده بریم ساده Gulam Hussain plays the rabab and sounds just like our teacher, Usta Muhammad Omar. He's younger than me. He used to serve the tea when I had my music lessons in Ustad's house. Now he's back after 10 years of exile in Pakistan. اگر به یاد داشته باشید این نیورتا خود طالب خانه بود شما به اینجا آمدید می آمدید اینجا دست کنه می گرفتید برمی برمی اینجا اینجا رایشی اینجا رایشی بگونید اینجا ارسی بگونید شما آمدید بالا سر اینجا خانه بود دبام تو تیم می شدن اینجا دیگر خانه ایش بود بیستن اولیش بود این خانه استاد با دوبار از خانه استاد باست سعی کنی ببینی همین جا سرائی کنی بله 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 So this is where I first learned to play the rabab all those years ago So Ghulam Hussein's speech addresses some of the issues facing the community, especially the loss of its elders and the prospect of the next generation taking on that role. Today, most of those ruined houses have been rebuilt by the Kharabot families with no external funding as far as I know. In the process, the Kharabot has resumed its role as a center for musical activity and learning. In that year, 2002, I also visited the state-owned Afghanistan radio and television station in Kabul, um, being particularly interested in the music archive, which BBC correspondent William Reeve, who I'm delighted to know is with us tonight, um, discovered that the archive had survived, more or less intact. There was a very low level of musical activity at the radio and television station, with no broadcasting of women singers, not even videos or audio recordings from the past. The Faculty of Fine Arts at Kabul University, which now had a small music department, was struggling with very limited human and instrumental resources. The music department of the Ministry of Information and Culture had recently received a gift of Western electric instruments and recording studio equipment from the Goethe Institute. 
and I visited the private orphanage Horasan House run by Sima Ghani, a former student in London who encouraged the children in her care. Here they are, performing the famous patriotic song associated with Awal Mir, Da Zamu Ziba Watan. This remarkable song serves as the unofficial national anthem, often played at concerts of Afghan music in the diaspora. It seems to appeal to many Afghans, even though they may not be Pashto speakers. As for the children, it expresses, surely, a message of hope for the future and forms a poignant contrast to the destruction of the Kharabot. On my return to the UK, I wrote a report for my sponsors with a list of recommendations. It seemed to me that the musical heritage most in need of support was the Afghan classical music, Ghazal Khani, that had developed in the context of the royal court, in contrast to the new music that had grown up in the diaspora. Sending the report and a copy of my film, A Kabul Music Diary, uh, to the person in charge of the Aga Khan Music Initiative, ACME, resulted in my being invited to organize a tradition bearers program to support the art of Ghazal singing in Kabul. I made a start in 2003, appointing four Ustads, master musicians, as teachers. Salim Bakhsh, vocalist, Golam Hussein, Rabob, Amruddin Golobzadeh, Del Ruba and Wali Nabizadeh Tabla. They were provided with a teaching room in the compound of the Foundation for Culture and Civil Society in central Kabul and provided with a small number of instruments. I did not instruct the Ustads to follow a particular music curriculum. I left it to them to teach in their own way using Indian sargam and tabla ball notations. In doing this, I followed the Ustad Muhammad Omar model that I had experienced as his student in 1973. I had also observed teaching sessions in Peshawar and knew these musicians were used to teaching and to running their own music courses. No other subjects were taught besides music in this fledgling Acme school. So I'm going to show you the four Ustads playing at a house concert in a moment. And the song they perform is entirely appropriate, Johnny Kharabotam, I am the beloved of the Kharabot, the signature tune of the musician's quarter. Just to give you a, a taste of the lyrics here, I am the slave of the saint of Kharabot, his kindness lasts forever, unlike that of the mullah or theologian, whose kindness comes and goes. Sometimes I am heaven, sometimes I am negation, sometimes affirmation, sometimes I am a mosque, sometimes I am a church, and sometimes I am Kaaba and Mecca. O oh, Sufi, listen to the essence of my sayings. 
I am the mirror of the essence of God. I am the sun of the skies because I am the soul of Harabot. I am the beloved of the Harabot. Okay. So this on the left is the, the tablet player, uh, Wally Nabizadeh. Here's Salim Bash with his harmonium. Uh, Ghulam Hussein is behind. And this on the right is Amrudin playing the Del Ruba. Here uh, next to his father is Rafi Bash and a son of his who is there to experience a musical performance. So that performance, although it isn't actually a ghazal, has got many of the aspects of this Kabbali classical music that I love so much and which uh, I really felt needed support to develop further. In 2005, I gave up my consultancy with ACME 
thinking I had done as much as I could at a distance, and was replaced by Mirwais Sidiqi, who took on the role of coordinator of the Tradition Bearers program and has done a marvellous job in developing the school over the next 10 years. Visiting Kabul in 2006, <clears throat> I was impressed by how much progress had been made with Mirwais in charge. The program had now become a fully-fledged school housed in a modern building with more students and many more teaching rooms and instruments. The original four Ustads were still teaching. Mirwai Siddiqui had also established a regional music instrumental group, Goldaste Kharabot, under the direction of Ustad Ghulam Hussein, which brought together instrumentalists from various parts of the country. The mode of teaching had also changed markedly from my original concept. Instead of one-to-one -one interaction between Ustad and student, with other students observing and learning from one another's mistakes, they had emphasized group teaching, with up to a dozen students practicing exercises and compositions in unison together. A curriculum had been established and examinations that had to be passed before the student proceeded to the next level. In 2009, a second ACME school was established in Herat with local Herati musicians as teachers of Ghazal Khani. So here's Ghulam Hussein's Rabab class in 2006. The students are learning a composition in the Kabli classical style, a piece attributed to Ustad Muhammad Omar. It's not easy to play being in a metrical cycle of 10 matras, 10 equal time units. And when I last visited the school in February 2014, I found that teaching had been extended to some of the regional musics of Afghanistan, with teachers of Tambur, Khaychak, Dotar, Tulak, and Dambura. So this was very much uh, a growing enterprise. So that brings me now to the second music school that I want to talk about, and that is the Afghanistan National Institute of Music, ANIM. In 1974, a vocational school of music was opened in Kabul, staffed by a number of Afghan musicians who had been trained in Western art music in the USSR. Prominent amongst them was Salim Salmast, an important figure in Radio Afghanistan as composer and conductor of the Orchestra Bozorg, an ensemble of 38 musicians playing Western, Indian, and Afghan instruments. The school was closed when the coalition government came to power in 1992. In 2004, Ahmad Sarmast, a son of Salim Sarmast, was awarded a PhD in musicology by Monash University in Australia and set about planning to revive the vocational music school where his father had worked. 
This project received strong support from the Monash Asia Institute, whose director, Marika Vicciani, wrote about the difficulties in gaining financial support from the Australian government. She wrote, music is not a priority for rebuilding Afghanistan. Rebuilding roads is perceived to be much more important and music education must take a lower priority than general education and literacy. These reasons, in quote Marx, reveal a shocking misunderstanding amongst policymakers of modern pedagogy, of the cultural importance of music to the various ethnic groups in Afghanistan and the healing powers of music. In an interview with The Guardian in 2013, Dr. Salmast expressed a strong belief in the incredible power of music and specifically in its ability to bring restoration and peace to Afghanistan. Music is a tool that can bring about social changes, contribute to the emotional healing of Afghan children and youth and establish a just and civil society. With generous funding from the World Bank and many other sources, especially in Germany and the United States, Dr. Salmast has been able to recreate the former vocational school of music. He hired a number of international staff, mostly young American music educators, to teach Western music and acquired a large stock of new musical instruments, Afghan, Indian and Western. In 2010, the Afghanistan National Institute of Music, ANIM, was officially inaugurated, teaching a broad educational curriculum with heavy emphasis on music. And it was also fully co-educational. ANIM's emphasis on teaching Western music is justified by the fact that it has been part of Afghan music culture since the early 20th century. But there are other reasons. As Salmast explains in the film, Dr. Salmast's Music School, made by an Australian director, some people told me, why does Afghanistan need Bach or Beethoven or Mozart? You should concentrate on Afghan traditional music. But Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, they don't belong to Europe. They don't belong to America. They belong to all the world. And I want Afghan kids to have access to the musical heritage of the world. In 2011, I made an informal visit to ANIM on behalf of the Society for Education and Music Pedagogy Research, otherwise known as SEMPRE, and for two weeks I enjoyed free access to the school. Back in London's Institute of Education, Dr. Evangelos Himonides, who is here with us tonight, uh, and I edited a short film about Anim called Return of the Nightingales. Here's a shot from the class of Indian music run by Ustad Irfan Khan from an illustrious musician family in India who taught sitar and sarod.
proud of him. In one year, that's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. So the students' rapid progress and dedication is shared by many of Anim's pupils who develop a passionate commitment to music. And one could understand this in terms of the healing powers of music as music therapy in action. Here's another clip from Anim, the wind ensemble taught by Ustad Sheftar, an Afghan who studied music in the Ukraine. He is Anim's choir master and also teaches woodwind. This shot is from a day of end of year performances. Ustad Sheftar introduces the children and names the pieces that they're going to play. He conducts sitting cross legged on the floor, and the brief pan to the audience gives a sense of the occasion. gives an indication of the excitement and enthusiasm of the end of year performances and the strong support fellow students give each other. Remember, this is after a year or a year and a bit of um, learning this music. In 2013, an Anim ensemble visited the USA with sold out concerts in the Kennedy Center and Carnegie Hall a residency at the New England Conservatory in Boston, and a concert at the Department of State and World Bank headquarters. In 2017, the Afghan Women's Orchestra, Ensemble Zura, performed at the Davos World Economic Forum, followed by a concert tour in Switzerland and Germany. ANIM is a successful and much admired initiative. And in 2013, Dr. Ahmad Salmast was awarded honorary membership of the Royal Philharmonic Society in London. Finally, I take you to a special event in Kabul. My visit in 2011 coincided with the first National Folkloric Music Seminar and Festival held in the historic and recently renovated Babu's Garden in Kabul. The organization of this important event brought together a number of institutions, notably the Ministry of Information and Culture, the Aga Khan Music Initiative, ACME, the Afghanistan National Institute of Music, ANIM, 
the Foundation for Culture and Civil Society and the Music Department of Kabul University. On the mornings of both days, Afghan scholars, intellectuals and academics presented 20-minute papers on various regional musics in Pashto and Dari. In the early afternoons, there were discussion sessions and a number of re resolutions were passed concerning matters such as copyright and censorship. In the late afternoons and early evenings, it was time for the festival, when 20 groups from many parts of Afghanistan performed their local regional music. Well, here's a short clip from the seminar. Dr. Rah Rahimi is reading a paper on um, music in Kandahar and has brought a famous singer along to perform his musical examples. Unfortunately, um, the, the person who had uh, agreed to uh, translate this for me um, was unwell and um, what I have is at the last minute. So of the two songs, uh, one is a wedding song. The translation is, the camel is ready, standing outside, O oh, Babalai, my darling. Come out, the camel is ready, so get into your palanquin. All the family and friends are here waiting, asking you to come. Today is your wedding. Come out, get on the camel. And the other song goes, my beautiful... Shin Khalai, dark green beauty spot, stand on the balcony. In the scenery from the balcony, your beauty stands out. In order for our love not to fail, do not make the mistake of becoming blind through pride in your own beauty. that very little ethnomusicological research has been conducted in Kandahar, but it's obviously, historically, uh, a very important uh, cultural centre. After the seminars came the festival concerts with musicians from many different regions. And here I've selected the group from Herat performing Olang Olang, a wedding song which is the unofficial regional anthem of Herat. And the song text goes... A leaf from the green tree, in the eyes of someone wise, each is a page from a book of wisdom. O oh, meadow, meadow, the excited nightingale, may God give his blessings to everyone. High in the upper room, your bed is made, may God give his blessings for your good fortune. The percussionist, who you see in a moment, is none other than Bulbul Herawi, the Herati nightingale, famous for his birdsong imitations, which you will hear from time to time.
So the seminar and the festival were significant events. They showed that local traditions were not, as many might have supposed, moribund after years of armed conflict, but had gone underground to be replaced by the new keyboard-based popular music in the post-Taliban outburst of musical activity. Now, despite the political uncertainties of the current situation, practitioners of these traditions were feeling confident to come out from under the shadow of ultra-Orthodox disapproval and repression to make their contribution to the gradually strengthening life of music in Afghanistan. Moreover, we see the emergence of an indigenous Afghan musicology with local experts studying and writing about their local traditions. One could connect all this with hopes for a renewed sense of national identity, for while distinct in themselves, the regional musics have many elements in common, comparable to local dialects of a single language. Collectively, they are an important part of that intangible notion of what it is to be an Afghan citizen, despite variations of language and ethnicity. The seminar and festival and the work of the schools are markers of deep processes of national cohesion. As my mentor, John Blacking, put it in somewhat old-fashioned terms, music is essential for the very survival of man's humanity. Music symbolizes the many good things that have been taking place in Afghanistan since 2001 in the domains of health, education, freedom of speech, freedom of expression. And it does not simply symbolize these positive developments. It has an important role in making them happen. Afghan music today, despite recent attacks, is the bellwether of better things to come in terms of reconciliation and political stabilization. Thank you very much.